Welcome to something to talk about. It's about to be gardening time, gardening, and I think a lot of uh, cookie baking. We may get a little of that in because Anne is with us with her hands full of cookie dough, it being that time of year. Uh, I want to start by thanking Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island for sponsoring something to talk about. Fieldstone offers assisted and independent living and a vibrant memory care community up on Rolling Bay. They have a day stay and a respite care program. To learn more, call 206-594-1010 or email Ashley C at FieldstoneCommunities.com or just go to FieldstoneCommunities.com or just go to Fieldstone and ask for a tour. Also, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water who have been plying the waters of the Salish Sea and living on its shores since time immemorial. We honor them and we are learning from their stewardship of these lands and waters. Thank you very much, Anne, for joining us in the middle of uh, all of your holiday baking to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, well, whatever we're going to talk about today. You know, believe it or not, there's a lot to talk about, even though this is like gardening in the big dark always seems weird to people. But there are certain things that this is a perfect time to do. And one of them is planting all kinds of bulbs, including garlic. It's traditional to plant garlic around the winter solstice. Supposedly, your bulbs will be a lot bigger and fatter. And the good news is you can get any kind of organic garlic that you have sitting around might even be sprouting a little bit in your kitchen. And if it is, just separate out the the um, cloves, plunk them pointy side up in a few inches of nice soil, and you will have big fat garlic bulbs to greet you in the spring or early summer. Um, and then that's time to plant second crop too. So you can like pull one crop and plant another crop. Boy, that sounds you know pretty darn easy. Yeah, you just don't want to let them go to flower. Like in the spring, the winter planted um, garlic tends to have the energy and be just thinking it would like to bloom. So if you start to see when a fat flower stalk coming up instead of just the usual greens, you want to cut it off at the pass. Good news is you can saute it. Um, that flower stalk is yummy in all kinds of things, just like a green onion, right? But you don't want it to bloom because you want the plant to go back and think about roots, not about flowers, right? Um, so although they're kind of cool looking flowers. Oh, they're great flowers. And actually, because you know, they're in the lily family and the flowers are quite florally fragrant and they don't smell like onions at all, um, which is always fascinating to me. And they're lovely as a garnish on all kinds of things. So if you do let them flower by mistake, oh well. It's you, not just don't, you just don't end up with, uh, with, with the garlic itself. You end up with the no. rest of it. And the thing that, like, if you let them go to seed, some people do that and say, oh, I'm going to grow garlic or onions from seed. It's totally doable, but it does take about seven years for garlic to come to really the size that it would do anything. So it's kind of more, it's a lot faster to just plant a clove, right? You get there quicker. Um, but yeah, but other bulbs too. Like I've had a number of people say, oh my gosh, I totally forgot that huge bag of bulbs that I bought at Costco or whatever. Um, this is not too late. In fact, it was almost never too late. One of the things that will happen is if you totally space out and plant them in May or something, ask me how I know this, um, they'll bloom, but they'll just be off, right? And it will take them a couple seasons if they're perennial bulbs to kind of get back on the swing of things because they don't really keep time the way we do. And when you plant them and they start sprouting, they just think it's time to do their thing. So if daffodils in August looks good to you, don't worry about it. You can plant them whenever. But if you planted things now, they would be pretty much right on and you wouldn't have any trouble at all. One thing that's really fun to do is a big, big pot and plant things at different depths. So you can put in a set, like a succession of bulbs of different sizes and types and they'll go boom, 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 and keep going for three months. That's what were you nice. going to ask me, Reed? I was gonna, well, I, so I got uh, my sister-in-law sent us an amaryllis bulb which is blooming um, and uh, a beautiful flower. Am I going to be able to get a couple seasons out of that somehow? Oh yeah. You should be able to get many seasons out of it, but it on sometimes I've had them bloom outdoors. Like I've whipped them back in the garden and had them last for a couple seasons, but boy, these last few winters, when it gets down to like 17, 15, uh -uh, that's not amaryllis temperature. They don't like that. But indoors as a house plant, you can certainly get them to grow on. The coolest thing is um, they'll pop. It's called pupping. They'll actually produce side bulbs 
little ones and then you can actually get a whole colony going like with mom in the middle and a bunch of kids on the side and you don't have to break them off but if you want to you can let it go dormant break them off and then plant them around they prefer kind of a shallow pot to a deep one so wider shallow bowl kind of thing works really well with them you still need the drainage but instead of letting them go completely dormant you grow them like a house plant and when the flower stalk fades take that off and then start feeding once a month or so with half strength indoor plant food whatever you use um, I like there's a Dr. Earth liquid one that I like a lot that's pretty mild because you don't want to juice it up, but you want to keep it growing and refeeding like the bulb. When you buy a bulb, it's already got the flower in it, basically, right? The bulb, the flowers already all curled up in there as a baby. Um, but now you've had that flower. And so if you want another baby, you have to um, give it something to work with, right? So a lot of times the Emery Willis bulbs come in a mixture of basically it's like uh, coconut fiber. It's not really nutritive. So I usually, you can do that the first time, but take it out, like gently knock that all off and put it in really nice like houseplant potting soil instead. There's EB Stone has a really nice one that I like a lot. Um, that will give it some nutritive value and then it can have more to grow on. But also remembering to feed it about once a month, dilute, dilute strength, that will, and then you'll get more strappy leaves. And the thing about amaryllis is, it takes five strappy leaves to get one flower stem. So if you can, one year I had like 17 strappy leaves and sure enough, there were like three big heads with four trumpets on each one. When I forget, sometimes there might be one stem with maybe two trumpets and they're not very big. So they need to eat something, right? Okay, so you're saying that after we have the uh, fireworks that we're enjoying right now, uh, you can cut back the growth or just no. let it? You don't cut it back. You wait till it, it goes soggy. It kind of goes pale biscuit colored. And you'll see that it's like the goodness of the bulb is getting going all the way down the stem. It's actually getting stored back into the bulb. That's the way the bulb feeds itself. So you let it do that slimy weird thing. You don't have to get it totally slimy, but and when it's brown and very soft, then you can cut that stem part off at the base, but the leaves will still be there, right? And some of the leaves will age out over time as any plant will, but you want to be not just feeding those leaves, but encouraging more. Um, but yeah, you can have, like I used to have quite a few of them before I moved four times in three years. Um, <laughs> you had to make some <laughs> tough choices. <laughs> Something's got to go. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, they look so beautiful when there's like some big ones and some little ones. It's like a little colony. It's really sweet. So yeah, those are um, one of the easier bulbs actually to to perennialize and keep going. But you were talking about some of the other things that might be out in our garden, I think, right? Like um, crocuses or whatever you might be trying to plant now that you are looking forward to in the spring. Right. And so that stacked bowl thing I was talking about, one of the cool ways to do that is put great big things like big, big border tulips or big daffodils kind of down it. Like you have a pretty good sized pot that might be a foot or 14, 16 inches deep. So toward the bottom, four inches up, say, you'd put the biggest bulbs and then put a few inches of soil over them and then put some smaller things in there, maybe some um, of those snowflakes. They're kind of like snowdrops, but they have dangly bells and they're a lot bigger. I like those in a big pot. And then as you work up adding soil and adding soil, you can add some of the early spring irises, the little teeny bulbous irises and the little crocuses and um, things like that. They don't need much soil base. And the miniature daffodils, like the little ones you can get at the grocery store, you can perennialize those really easily. But what's fun too is like layering them into these pots and you'll get boom, 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 sequences of bloom and you let them all dry off. You put them somewhere under a bench or something like that so they don't get wet all summer. They dry themselves out. When they wake up in the fall, right, you start giving them, let them get wet with the rain and so forth. And then you feed them a little bit and put a little compost on top of there and give them a little, again, half strength food, maybe once a month or so, feed those bulbs back up again. And that way they're going to um, persist for years, right? Even if you don't have a big garden to do it in, you can do it on a patio or a deck or in a small space. It sounds really fun to me. It is fun. We, um, 
I was also going to talk a little bit about how to handle every year people give each other holiday plants that come out of the grocery store or whatever. And some of them are just beautiful. There's often some azaleas or even hydrangeas sometimes. Um, and some of these different, you know, Christmas flowering things that have been encouraged chemically to bloom off season, which they wouldn't be doing outdoors. But a lot of and those things like the hydrangeas and the azaleas specifically, those are perfectly hardy outside, but you can't just put them out in January. You have to wait, like harden them off because they've been living in a greenhouse, they've been chemically pumped. And so again, treat them like a house plant, um, water from the bottom up to make sure that the whole root bulb stays really nice and moist. Oh, and the critical thing that gets a lot of people in trouble is they come in this bright wrapped stuff, like plastic, you know, bright colored foil or whatever, and big ribbons, you got to take that off because that actually creates perfect, perfect conditions for mold and mildew and root rot, which is not really the goal. So you take all that stuff off, put it in a deep saucer, um, deep because you want to water from the bottom. So not just a little shallow thing, but one of the deeper saucers and, and bottom watering, make sure that the whole plant will, and you'll see a thirsty plant, you can pour the water in and it'll just suck it right up as fast as you pour it in, which tells you something about how, you know, because pouring from the top, you're just watering usually about the top couple inches of soil, but it's the roots are doing their job down below. So you want to make sure they're actually getting what they need. And when you feed them, you can put a little water in the saucer, let it get sucked up and then put the liquid fertilizer in the saucer with a little more water diluted and it goes right to the roots, which is that part that is actually going to use it, right? not the top. So hardening them off means, you know, you enjoy them, they look great. Then around January, February, they start to look a little tired. By March or April, they're looking a little ratty. Um, with the hydrangeas, you want to cut the blooms off when they fade. You don't want them to spend time trying to make seed because that's just going to distract them from their job. Um, and so cut those, but, but you want to, again, keep it growing, do the mild fertilizer every month. And then when they're ready to go outside, I start staging them out, like putting them like summer camp, you know, they go outside for a day and come back at night until it's really, they're acclimated and then they can go out. Or if you have an unheated greenhouse, they can move into that and they'll get enough acclimation that way that you can put them in the garden when you're ready. Be prepared for them to be larger in the garden than they were in the pot. And a lot of times the hydrangea ones, especially, there might be five pieces in there because they usually root cuttings and jam them all in to get this big bushy effect. So you can just go ahead and plant that whole thing and it'll make like a bush. Or if you if you really liked it and you wanna share it, before they go into the ground, you can gently tease them apart and pot each one up again and give it a little time to adjust and make new roots and then pop each of those into the garden or give them to a friend or bring them to the senior center and we'll plant them in the back, right? Sounds like <laughs> an excellent idea. <laughs> The azaleas are usually one thing. You'll look and they just have one major stem. But again, those it's are- interesting awesome. about the hydrangea. It's sort of like a florist type trick. Make yeah. it look like, yeah. You know. Well, right. And they did that with those little roses. You know, the little roses you can buy that are six inches tall and they're adorable, right? Well, those have been chemically dwarfed. And if you look at those, they almost always have five or six little pieces again. And those also can be pulled gently apart grown on into separate plants. And they'll usually be about three feet high, generally speaking, two to three, sometimes a little more even. Um, but it's, you know, again, you could just plant the whole thing and have sort of a one bush look and it will be fine. But if you wanted to have more, a little row of them or share them out with friends, again, the time to do it is before, like when they're getting ready, you're transitioning to the outside go ahead and pull them apart and plant them separately or put them in pots separately and let them grow on a little bit longer um, to grow those roots out. And then you can put them anywhere you want, right? So oh, around here, the hardening thing, the, the idea of acclimating to the outdoors would start in the early spring? Usually, I mean, who knows, right? I used to have a pretty good sense of where the timing was on everything outside, but boy, anymore, it's kind of hard to say. Like last, was it a week or two ago? It was snowing on Saturday and 56 degrees on Sunday. And they call that winter whiplash. And the plants have the same problem with that that we do. I mean, I heard frogs, right? 
frogs creaking. Yes, yes. No, I took a walk, uh, you know, like on that day after the, and yes, the frogs were out there acting like it was no problem. They well, must have been no really problem. confused. It's okay for them because they're, um, they can do summer hibernation is called estivation and they can do that. If it gets too hot and dry, they'll estivate and wait until it gets cooler, warmer, whatever. I mean, cooler and wetter. But in the winter, if it gets cold, too cold for them, they'll go into more like a regular hibernation, but they'll come out in every thaw. And so it isn't like, so, you know, it used to be more consistent because things used to be different. But what we can see is like, you'll hear them croaking when you get a nice big thaw. And they did it a couple of weeks ago because it hadn't gone on long. The cold wasn't here long enough for them to really go deep into their dormancy. So they'll wake up, come back. And we'll see the bees do that too. I yeah. still have sweet peas. I still have sweet peas blooming, which is nuts. And they, um, they're, they get bees every day. And I'm like, you well, I've, I, I've had nights like that too. I keep waking up, wandering <laughs> around. Um, I'm wondering. So yeah, I, you know, the, the, uh, winter or, uh, winter blooming plants like, uh, camellias or whatever, like the ones you planted outside Eagle Harbor church, uh, -huh. uh what are they, who are they attracting for pollination? Well, that is a really good question. They usually, they get pollinated. If you watch them, some of them are going to be pollinated by not bees, but other small insects um, that come, that are more winter hardy. Like a lot of our native bees really are only out and about for a short time, maybe a couple weeks, maybe a month. And then they are doing their dormancy thing and laying eggs and so forth. The honeybees have a much longer out season, right? But, and some of them will come out now and again, but most of the, most of them are gonna be either dormant or dead by that time. But you'll notice that there's quite a lot of other things like hoverflies, for instance, or um, some of the little teeny, uh, they're wasp-like, maybe they really are little, proto wasps or something that are teeny and you'll see some of those small pollinators there but you'll also see things like hummingbirds fussing around um because they really are smart and that you know years ago hummingbirds didn't used to hang around up here in the winter time at least as far as we're aware but back in the 50s and 60s when people started putting out more bird feeders and there were a lot more people here um and they put hummingbird feeders out more reliably a lot of the annas especially started hanging around. And so they've got accustomed to it. We have quite a little colony of them here in, in the Noble Home Park. But what you'll see is they also take advantage of a lot of winter flowers like hellebores. They'll be nuzzling around in there or fats hetera, which is that big bold leafed plant that looks like marijuana on leather steroids, but it's not, but it's related to ivy, um, you know, but it's not, a. it's a big shrub right, with big leaves, and it has these pom-poms, crazy looking uh, sprays of big fat white decorated pom-poms all over the top. And they're quite fragrant. And that's hummingbird heaven. And you'll see hummers on that all the way through until the flowers fall off, usually in January, February, March. Um, so that's another one. The hummingbirds are all over my sweet peas, right? So yeah, that's another, and they're pollinators too, you know, any, but then you, whatever right. you stick in there is going to get some. Right. It's good. It. right. They're going to go somewhere else and right. Share do the, the business. Share the party. Right. Yeah. So uh, let's see, you were talking a little bit about, um, about house plants uh, that are, or holiday plants and turning them into house plants for a little while. What about house plants generally? Well, before we get off that, I did want to mention the poinsettia problem. Yes, we definitely should talk about that. Because <laughs> one of the things about poinsettias is that they often they don't just die. So you feel guilty and you just keep nursing them on and on and on. And they never really look that great. Again, those are plants that have been chemically treated to do whatever they're going to do. Um, a lot of them are really fancy hybrids now. So, you know, you get the splotches and the marbled look and the different colors and all that kind of stuff. But in nature, they're big straggly shrubs, usually, mostly in Mexico and South and Central America to some extent. Um, and they are not winter hardy at all. So putting them outside is a good way to kill them if you just finally want to be done with it, but you can't quite bring yourself to just throw in the compost. Oh, I'll just let them go free. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah them free um 
but you can, I have done this in my youth, my misspent youth, you can grow them on like a house plant, encourage them, water them, fertilize them, but to get them to do the coloring thing again, the sepals, they're not really petals, they look like it, um, they're very light sensitive. So you put them in a closet, a dark closet, should you even have such a thing, and they have to be in there for like six weeks, growing on, being watered, being gently fed, and then you bring them out and the burst of light and warmth that they get encourages them to color up, just like the autumn leaves, right? Same kind of principle. Um, it, you can do it, you know, if you really don't want to shell out 598 for another one, it's possible. But I just don't really feel like it's that, uh, that worth it. And the thing to remember too, they are toxic, not hugely. Like the poison control center said, yeah, a toddler, could be really harmed if they ate two whole plants, which not, a, I mean, that takes a while. You'd have to. That, yeah, that's, uh, I, uh, most toddlers aren't that interested in that many leaves. And it's not like they're tasty, right? The cats sometimes nibble them. It's not great for them, but they'll throw up, but they throw up anyway. They just do that. So, um, you know, I don't think their toxicity is a huge issue. And you can put them in the compost and feel very, very comfortable about it. So that would okay, be. Okay, that's a good thing. Yeah. There we go. Farewell, right? Fair, farewell, and I do. I'll put you there with the with the leftover celery ends or whatever. Yeah. Thank you and goodbye. Um, but yeah, but the regular house plants. So here's the thing. Um, when I worked at Bainbridge Gardens, Junko Huri always said, "There's a window of transplanting or repotting plants, and people miss it. If you pot, if you replant them, pot them up now, they actually get stunted a little bit." which is interesting. It's like, this is not quite their time. But he said, after the solstice, once that passes and you're sliding into January, that's when you can transplant houseplants and have the best success with it. So I thought that was interesting and I started experimenting. And sure enough, it does seem like they do adapt better when after the solstice than before. He said the window of transplanting trees, for instance, and, and transplanting perennials is like, Thank ha Halloween up until the solstice. So that all that kind of stuff, you can still kind of move things around in the garden. And then you got to stop and wait until the middle of February before you start moving stuff in the garden around again. But I thought that was so interesting that house plants really do want you to wait a little bit after the solstice, wait till New Year's, dig in, and then you can pop them up again. It's a great project if you're kind of bored and you have a lot of space that you can put down a big tarp. And yeah, busy. because it isn't a really simple chore and you don't actually want to do it over the sink because unless you have mega big pipes, you're going to end up with a lot of dirt down the sink, which can clog your drain. Ask me how I know. Yeah. yeah. But if you if you get out that uh, tarp that you don't want to use outside and put it all over your living space and then just get involved, that sounds like I mean, it sounds like kind of a if the tarp's big enough, it's actually a good family activity. It is. It's great, actually. And if you have a carport or a garage, a place you can spread a tarp and dump out the dirt, then it's actually pretty fun. Um, and then what you of course, people don't really think about this, but have your new pots ready. Like if they're clay, you want to have them pre-soaked. If they're uh, not, you know, if they're ceramic or something like that. Just make sure that you have plenty of broken pots on hand to crock the bottom so that that keeps that drainage hole open. Make sure you have your big saucers ready. Um, it's like surgery, right? So you want all your stuff lined up so you don't have to get, go, oh crap, I didn't get this or that. You get it all ready, bring the potting soil. You're not gonna reuse the soil that comes out of the pot. In fact, if the plant's been in the pot very long, there may not hardly be any soil to remove because you get that thing where the coil, the roots are coiled really tight all around the outside. They've done, they've eaten the soil, it's gone. And now what the job is to put them in a bucket and let them soak. And then you gently tease them apart and be amazed at how many there are. <laughs> There's a lot of roots there. If you have to put it back in the same pot or the same size pot, you can actually cut a bunch of those roots off, loosen up the big ball in the middle, soak it again, and then repot it with fresh soil and that way you could get new roots and it, and you'll be able to keep putting that thing in that back in that same pot. Does that make sense? Yeah, we had a huge, we have a huge plant in the living room that we had to, that had done that thing. Right. And, uh, and there was no pot big enough 
exactly. on earth as far as I could that I was going to move that could take right. it. So a little trimming helped. Yeah. And don't be afraid. You can cut those roots off and say, hello, it's morning. Um, they don't mind because those are, you know, the active feeding roots are like looking for something good and there's nothing good there. But you do have to really scrub that pot because a lot of times you'll see crusty, like white stuff on the edge of the pot. It's mineral salts that have precipitated out of either the potting soil or the fertilizers. And those need to be scrubbed away pretty nicely before you can go at it. Um, so there's a bucket of water to soak things in. There's a bucket of water to wash your pot in. Your tarp's getting a little crowded. There's big bags of potting soil, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes the plant will need to be, I'm getting a glare from this cat. Um, sometimes oh, I, think, I, think be because, I think because your cat hasn't been introduced. Oh, this is Sophie. You want to say hey? Well, yeah, she's been talking to us. Right. Sophie, um, I think, is feeling like the grandkids are in her space, and now she's going to be in mine. Right? It, um, if the plant is really huge and has outgrown you know, the pot in some ways, you can also prune that plant back a little bit, depending on what it is. Take a good look at it. Sometimes you'll see if stems that are looking on the weaker side, you might cut them back to above a leaf and then as you fertilize it it will start to regrow from that that joint um and and refurbish itself better a lot of times too they get uneven because they're facing one direction with light and two-thirds of it is in a corner or something like that if you want to round them out a little bit you just turn them every three months a quarter turn and they get more uh, evenly distributed rita i was gonna um say a little something about Patio winter gardening on a patio because you've got a little patio out there, right? What have you got going in there? I have, I have a um, a geranium from that I got from you, and it's it's got a couple blooms on it, and I got a couple of like fuchsias, and they're still this one is still blooming and it's just amazing. And I'm thinking if we have a mild winter, it might be okay. Plus I've got over in one pot, I've got this white um, heliotrope that is the most fragrant thing. And I brought it over from the adventure house and I put it in a pot here and it probably will need to be repotted in the spring, mm -hmm. I think, but it still has blooms on it and it doesn't look too bad. And so I don't have, you know, too, too many other things, just a, those couple of fuchsias. And I do have a, a vining maple. I think I've got one and you've got, there's one at your house that I need to put together in a pot. But um, I, I was thinking about getting some, you know, big pots, but, but I don't want to get them too big. So, uh, you know, to move them can be kind of tough. Yes, it's definitely, they can be hard, but that's why in a balcony, especially, I always think it's great to get a really big lightweight plastic or rubberized, that kind of rubbery plastic or a tree pot um, from the nursery, because by the time you put, if you take with some of those pots weigh a ton, you know, 30 to 50 pounds, right, or more, and if you put a whole bunch of soil in them, and the soil gets wet, now you're talking some serious weight. And you don't really want to do that on a balcony, right? Um, and the pot should be close to the wall of the structure, the building, not out toward the edge of the balcony, right? The big ones for sure. Um, but also, you know, with, you do the saucer thing, of course, and you put them on feet maybe so it doesn't mark your deck. But one of the things you can do with like the hardy fuchsia is if, if it starts to feel like it's going to get really cold, Use some of that bubble wrap that came with all the whatever and wrap it around and then put a, a like a drop cloth kind of thing over the whole thing. And that will give you a good five or six degrees of frost protection a lot of times without much else. And then if it gets sunny, you want to take it off because you don't want it to build up and make mold or anything like that. But it's it's a really it, plus the wind can be a factor up there so sometimes if it gets really you know there's a windstorm coming through you might want to do that kind of protective cover for the day or night and make sure they don't get burned i know i was surprised even though i'm not up doesn't seem like very high this fall i went out a couple times and i was surprised <laughs> at how windy it was up here um so i had to you know move a couple things around 
and take them off of some hanging stands that I had and put them down lower. And that has been much better. But yeah, I was I was surprised at the amount of wind, even just, you know, up, up on the second story. Yeah. And, the, you know, a, a really big wind can knock them over or even blow them off the edge, which would be really not great for whoever was underneath it. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good consideration. But there's also the kind of additional extra light, like because you're way up high, you're getting really right. good light from multiple directions. So the benefit will be, you know, and getting direct sun up there, which down, you know, on the ground level, maybe you wouldn't. So that will give you a little boost in the spring when things start coming back again, right? Right, exactly. And then I thought of getting some um, of those little tiny, they'll be coming out pretty soon in the pots, the little tiny, um, like the daffodils, like the jonquils. Yeah. And I've had those before and then put them around the edge. Just stick the whole pot in there. Don't take them out of their little pot and kind of plant them in there and then kind of have them like that. So I've been thinking, of, I've been thinking about that. And then I wanted to ask you one other thing on the paper whites and the stuff we're for forcing. I know there's, if you put some alcohol, I guess, in the water, it keeps them from getting too tall, but I don't know what the proportion is. Yeah, Cisco's really into that. He always wants to put vodka in the water. Basically though, if you can save enough light, they don't do that. They get okay. too long and leggy like that when they are in, they don't get enough direct light. So okay. if you have a sunnier windowsill, which you do actually, yes. um, they, they will be fine. And the thing is they're not very frost hardy. So you can't actually, you can't actually winter them over I mean, put them out in the garden and expect them to come back. They will. No, no, I know. I just go, mm, okay, it's for a season. Right. <laughs> a little gift to myself. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Maybe does Mimi have any garden questions? Let's see. We'll try to get her to speak up here. Right. How's your your hardy fuchsia doing? <laughs> Uh-oh. Does that mean it didn't do? <laughs> Never mind. Moving along. <laughs> um, but my son brought home some paper whites from school that he wants to plant outside. Mm -hmm. Paper whites are indoor plants. And That's they, they can't live outside. But you need a really sunny windowsill for them. I've got one. Perfect. And big saucer underneath, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. He can try like after they're over, if he wants to try to put them, because they rarely come back with any, because you've, you know, they use themselves up. So they usually bloom out, um, but they won't survive the winter usually. Yeah, I've done them inside before. I love paper whites, but he had his heart set on outside. And so before I was just. No. I bet if you went to one of the nurseries, they still would have something like daffodils or something he could plant yeah. outside. We were just talking before you got here about bulbs and how it's a great time to drop some of those daffodils in. So, yeah, yeah, Sophie's here too, helping us with Sophie's making. helping us out. Maybe. Wow, I'm pretty impressed. I came up with something on the fly. It's good. Right? Anyway, for what we hadn't talked about, and exactly. that's a common gift that we get this time of year. That is true, and they usually grow in pebbles, right? And that's partly why they don't come back because there's no nu nutritional value in pebbles. Or it takes like a million years for them to turn into minerals. And well, the same nutritional yeah. value is that stuff that amaryllis comes in. Yeah. Oh, and here we like have. Yeah, look, there you go. Look I, at that, I, I need Rita. to spotlight her. What, what What is this we got? Paper whites. Right. Oh. This is my, um. these are my paper whites. And see the roots? I've got them in rocks. And they went real tall. And But I usually do these. I've done these. In years past, like I'd get them planted so I could give them at Thanksgiving to my sisters when I saw them. And it's just the best, easy thing to do mm -hmm. that I just love. It just, and I usually get the Zevas just because they're fragrant. I know a lot of people don't like the fragrance. It's kind of hard for them. But it is just, they're just lovely. And I just think that they're the best little winter thing in the whole white world. So. I and just it's, love an, them. it's another plant you can feel guilt free about putting in the compost when they're done, which is also exactly. nice. You don't have to nurse exactly. them along and feel like you've murdered something. They're they've done their thing. They've spent their wad. Now you're like, thank you. That was lovely. 
Right. And I'm in my guilt. The rest of my part. garden. Right. The Come back to part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. But yeah, and that it, it that kind of container is perfect. It doesn't have to have drainage for those. And just keep dumping the water in every few days so that it doesn't dry out completely and they're just happy as can be. But yeah, the alcohol thing is mostly when it's a low light situation, they just don't do so well or they get leggy like that, right? Um, one thing I was gonna say about the amaryllis before when, if you repot amaryllis, which you can do, um, you wanna make sure the top third say of the bulb is above the soil level, which is counterintuitive because most bulbs we plant the depth of the bulb more or less. Um, but with amaryllis, they really like to have the top of their bulb sticking up. Kind of like with ir bearded iris, have they like the top of their corm above the soil level. Um, some plants are actually getting more nutrients that way than you would think. And so um, if they're planted up to their neck, they don't do as well, they tend to get rotten. And so the having, cause you'll notice that the, especially with amaryllis, they have the, a lot of those papery sheaths. And if they get too much water in that, that's where the rot can start and rot out the bulb. That's why bottom watering, saucer watering is much better for amaryllis than top watering, just like other houseplants. I did want to talk a little about tool care. Um, and several people asked me if I was going to talk about hoses. And I was happy to do that. Um, if you have not brought your hoses in, it's a really good time to do that too. And also to put one of those little foam coverlets over your hose connection, your hose bib, because they can freeze. And then that's more expensive than just the $4 that it costs to put the frost protector on it. Uh, but drain the hoses flat, like lay them all out and coil rubber hoses, but don't hang them because when you hang them on the hanger, that actually creates a weakness in the, which later becomes the kink point or the break point. But so store rubber hoses flat, right? You can hang, cloth hoses, those perforated cloth hoses, because um, they don't care, right? But on the whole, hanging hoses is not a great idea. If you are, if you have to, and there's no room, look for the kind of saddle-like hose holders that are not a hook or a straight bar, but they have a pretty wide um, area that you can put the hose over in that way. It won't kink as much, that piece. Some people were asking specifically about soaker hoses. Um, again, you want to pick those up and drain them really, really well. I think I've talked about this before, but apparently uh, it needs to be said again. And when you buy a soaker hose, the end has a cap to seal it off. But you can take that cap off and attach it to another one so you can link them like Christmas lights, right? You want to hang onto those caps. So I always wire them, put a little wire around it and around the thing and attach it to the end of that hose. Because when you separate your hoses, you want to put the cap back on and you want to keep the cap on it so that it keeps it clean and dry and nobody moves in because sometimes in the garden you'll get slugs in there and the shed or you know, might get spiders in there um etc and a lot of times they leave gunj behind i actually had bees laying eggs and like nesting in a hose at one point um so it's better to make sure you have the caps on so that nobody gets in there who isn't supposed to be there right but you want to shake them out and sometimes you have to wash them off make sure they get clean or just shake all that dirt off as it dries out and then store those dry. And then when the, the spring, when you wanna put them out again, make sure that you can try a dry run or a wet run, fix them to a hose and make sure they sprinkle all the way to the end evenly. And if they don't, you might wanna shake them and take a, actually a little, um, I have a little teeny brush that you use for hummingbird feeder things and wire brush. You can use one of those and kind of run it up and down in the hose to clean out the gunge, which is usually at the ends. Right, but that's a good thing to be doing right these days. But tool care is also important and it's something a lot of people don't do much of. Um, it's interesting to me that, you know, you buy a shovel or a trowel and you use it for a while and it never seems to cross our minds that they might need to be sharpened. And a lot of shovels when you buy them are not sharpened. And so people don't realize that they can work differently if they are, right? So you, what you need is a bastard file, which is like a rough rasp and um, some steel wool, a lot of times, linseed oil for the handles if they're made of wood. But you take the rasp and you set the, I usually set the shovel on a chair or something so that, that it's away from me and I'm rasping away from me 
and you put an edge, kind of a fine edge on the bevel, almost on the bottom, and then you flip the shovel and do the same thing, kind of bevel the edge, and you get a pretty good sharp edge on it. Well, it makes so much difference when you're digging, you'll be amazed, right? It's like, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. Because you work so much harder when you're pushing a slightly rounded object through the soil than when you're pushing a really sharp one through the soil. Is that a bastard file? Yeah, there you go. Doesn't look like a bastard, but it works that way, right? Um, and then the, the um, linseed oil, you wanna rub into the wooden handles let it soak in. It's been, I usually don't rub it off for a day or two because it takes a while to soak in. And so let it kind of do that. And if you have extra oil, you put it, or even you can use vegetable oil, really. Put some in a bucket with sand and mix it up. And that's where you can run your trowels and your shovels and tools like that into this bucket of sand. And it will take off all the gunge that's on there. And also be like a little bit of, it's a little abrasive. So it'll be like a little bit of um, sandpaper kind of cleaning off any rust that might build up on those tools. And it puts a little thin coat of oil on them so that when we're sitting in the shed, in the moist humidity over the winter time, they don't get rusty. Nice. I guess that's not too much work. It's actually not. It's kind of a fun thing. You put some music on, you sit out <laughs> here, right? Kind of do your, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's, and it's also kind of one of those olden day things, like people used to do that all the time. And I think we've lost like tool sense in some ways. It's like hand tools that need hand care kind of are part of like our historic past, right? And I like doing those kind of olden things where I feel like, yeah, people have been doing this for hundreds of years. And if we don't, we're kind of missing something, like missing a connection. And using tools properly and taking care of them, I think that's really, it's like getting your kitchen knives sharpened, right? We have Bill Booth at the Senior Center who does a fabulous job. Bill, just this last week, sharpened all the tools for the weed warriors, right? And I mean, he knows, there's a man who knows how to put an edge on some things, right? But I think if you do a little weed uh, tool care, and it's that's the kind of thing that's a meditative kind of fun thing to do on a drizzly day when you're in the shed or the, carport or garage or something like that. It's kind of fun. There's something else I was going to talk about and I can't remember yep. what it was. Well, I can tell you what it was. It was um, seed starting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. Because I was going to talk about microgreens too. So one of the fun things to do if you have seeds that you didn't use last year, which most of us do, or maybe even the year before, or possibly antique, um, but seeds for things like turnips, cabbage, kale, all that kind of stuff, they might or might not be reliable for sowing in the garden, but what they're great for is microgreens. So if you take one of those, um, like if you ever bought salad in a box, one of those perforated clamshell big boxes. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, so those are perfect. You put some potting soil in the bottom, two or three inches of potting soil. You want it on a saucer because it's going to leak, right? But you got to have holes in the bottom, and that's why those salad boxes are good because they do, because you need air to the roots. But then you just scatter that seed that you're not so sure if it's any good anymore or not. And then the top is like a little mini greenhouse, so it keeps everything moist enough, and you'll get all these little micro sprouts. And as they come up, there'll be red ones and green ones and, you know, little yellowy ones. And you just take your nail scissors or something and clip the tops off and put them in your salads. It's great. And in two or three weeks, you'll use that up, put it in the compost, start again. Um, I think it's really a fun. And it, I love like being around growing things. I think the smell of it, the taste of it is so sparkly and wonderful. It doesn't get any fresher than that, right? Uh, and it's really, it's a neat garnish and it's fun for salads or put it on some of your tomato soup, right? I just love when your grandkids say, "What is that?" You say, "Beats me," <laughs> right? But it perks up the flavor of everything. Yeah, right? I bet it does some sp sparkly spiciness. Radishes are great. Cabbage has that little bite that's really wonderful. Turnips, kale, any of things like that, um, and of course, any kinds of old lettuce or whatever. That's all good too. And you can let them grow on a little bit. They'll be crowded, so they'll be skinny and tall. But that's okay, because, but you know. You could pay a fortune for that, or you can just do it with what you have around. And I do that every couple of weeks, really, and just think it's just kind of a fun way to 
have something alive with you in the kitchen, right? The other thing you can do now, if you want to, is um, if you've saved seed and stuff in the past, all the hardy annuals, like calendulas or, um, you know, uh, the sweet peas are another really good one. Um, sweet William is one or feverfew, all that kind of stuff that's, you know, little perky plants that go on and on and on. You can sow those now or pretty close. I'd actually probably wait till New Year's, uh, but they will sprout really pretty fast and then start growing slowly outside. And then by the time spring actually gets here, who knows when it will be, those plants have a big leg up and they're all ready to go. So they'll be blooming weeks earlier than anything you sow in March or April, right? So that is a fun way to get, I love annuals in the garden anyway, California poppies, right? That kind of stuff that's just effortless. I especially love calendulas. You probably have figured that out by now because I talk about them all the time. But um, that, it's one of the one the plants that will just put along forever and all winter long there'll be some little cheerful flowers on there right it's easy peasy and it's one that all the pollinators just love another thing that's great about it is the flowers are edible in salads so you can toss those in with your microgreens and make a spunky little or put them in a sandwich right they're just yummy i think oh. anita was going to try to make some sort of cream out of them too he did yes and so, and so if I do that every year and Jerry Harrington and I do that both um, and Jerry got me doing it and it's so great. I have rosacea as you may notice my face flushes now and again, um, but this calendula cream is super soothing. So it's organic coconut oil and you put it in a crock pot on the lowest temperature, not the highest, because you don't want to cook the stuff. You want to steep it. And then I usually put in like a quart of, of organic coconut oil and about a quart of dried kind of pressed down dried calendula petals and you can save them all summer long and then let them steep for four to six hours pour it through some cheesecloth some muslin and then you'll get this uh lovely creamy stuff now if it's if your house is warm it doesn't solidify as well or in the summer it can get kind of you know like liquidy so put it in the fridge and then it feels really nice on your face anyway that cool lovely cream but it's great for my daughter my granddaughter had terrible rash on her wrists from like they used to call them chill blains, like winter cold rash when they had outdoor school and they weren't allowed to come in and they had to eat their lunches outside during the COVID years and but the calendula gel fixed it right up so I thought that was kind of cool so I don't know what feverfew is feverfew is like a tiny daisy and it's had five or six name changes in the last few years but they used to be called uh, they're like mini marguerites. Sometimes they're called that. Um, they've had a lot of different names, but they're in the chrysanthemum family, essentially, like all daisies. And their flowers are about so big, teeny, like the size of my little thumbnail. And there'll be sprays of little white flowers um, with golden centers and little fine feathery foliage. I think I grew some for Laura because she had migraines. And yeah, and one of the things that's cool about the foliage of feverfew Fever few foliage is ferocious for migraines. And um, there was even an article in the British Lancet magazine, the medical magazine, that talked about how it was more effective to eat a leaf or two of, of fever few every day than some of the medications on the market. Did you actually ever try it, Laura? You know, I, I, I have tried that, but I've tried it with so many other things that I can't say what what's doing what. <laughs> But, but I, you know, I figure, you know, let's throw everything at it. And, and, you know, with something like that, you don't feel bad about having it. You, you know right. what I mean? Right. So, and, right. Yeah. And they actually have a kind of a fun, there's another thing you could put a little bit of in your salad, right? The ferny foliage, they taste pretty green, but it's, I like a mixed salad. It's like having arugula or something in there, just a little bit. Ferny, ferny foliage of feeder few. Yeah. The ferny foliage of fever few. I think the Farkle family did something with that. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, anyway, I think one of the early I... bloomers, the things that blooms and blooms perennially, and you'll like every year for Christmas or the solstice, I've always made these little tussy mussies. And I meant to make one this morning, but with the kids here and all the 
cookie baking I got a little behind. But basically you go out in the garden and you pick a leaf or two of maybe purple sage and a little bit of rosemary and maybe there's still some calendulas. You put that in or a rosebud because there's usually a rosebud on something, right? And bundle them all up. And I use long strings of grass, perennial grasses to tie them up and make these little bundles. And maybe I'll put some oregano in there. And it's, there's always mint, always. Like, I don't care even if you didn't plant it, you somehow have mint in your garden, right? And so I'll put some sprigs of mint. And these tussie mussies were invented during the Elizabethan times when everything smelled terrible outside. Like all the streets were cesspools and horrible, but they were used and you would hold it near your nose. So the aromatic herbs would be in little rose petals or something would make a lot nicer smell than what was on the street or on your shoes by the time you walked across the street. So you'd carry these tussie mussies around but I just think they're charming. And I always make them at this time of year and sort of leave them at my neighbor's houses and stuff. And there's always some fever pew. There's always calendulas. There's almost always rosebuds. There's always mint and lavender, rosemary, oregano. Those are kind of the perennial things. And a lot of times you can find some pretty foliage. Like again, purple sage is really pretty or just regular sage, velvety kind of leaves and make those be like the backdrop and then tuck everything in, tie it all up in a little bundle. And they're adorable, right? I mean, what's not to love? So that's what I would say, like make yourself a solstice tussie mussy, right? And make one for a friend. Nice. And call in the light. This is that, yeah, this is the week. This is the time. I know we won't notice it in our day-to-day uh, -day startings and stoppings of the sunlight for a week or so, but it's changing. We're having our solstice event tomorrow with my family, which, as you can probably tell from the background thrashing noises, um, is here. And we're going to have a little fire bowl. And what we do is write down on paper or we make pet drawings or write about things we want to let go of for the year to come. And we burn those up. And then we might write about things that we hope for or we hope to learn or do or manage in the year to come. And then we burn those up and send all of them sparkling off to the sky because that's a way to kind of nurture hope and move forward into the light, right? So Thank you for bringing a little light into our day every, every month for this discussion. And of course, many other times during the month as well. But uh, I really appreciate the time and I hope you all have a wonderful solstice and holiday ahead. And Bonnie, I gotta know what kind of cookies you're making. Oh, they're um, colombianas. So they're um, you 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 bury them in in powdered sugar and you put little cloves in them and anyway. But you know, my mom would always make them, um, and you know, and and I I would help usually. But and that was when we only had a hand mixer, and so you know, mixing the butter, I thought I was going to die. But um, but anyway, much easier now with a stand mixer, but. But they're fun. I mean, you know, it's great. You yeah. know, another trick. I, the way what we do is, I put a stick of butter in a bowl and I put it in the oven with the oven light on. Oh. I go about my business and do other things, and by the time I remember and get back to it, it's all nice and soft, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's. I, I spent a lot of time last night scraping the butter off the paddles. Yeah. <laughs> it's too hard. Yep, yeah, but but they're but they're they're fun. And, you know, and then you always know who had one because they're covered in powdered sugar. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas I'm covered in, look at my apron that my grandkids made for me. Oh, that is awesome. Isn't that so great? Yeah. And I got it for Christmas last year and I use it all the time. It's really a good one. It's, it makes all the difference. Thank you, Laura, for your little yeah. uh, baking example. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. Bye-bye. So long, everybody.